Hello and welcome to the first keynote of the 2023 Seed Savers Exchange Annual Conference, Traditional Food, Health, Culture, and Biodiversity with presenter Raphael Meyer. I'm Janine Shepard and I will be your host for this session. Thank you to Humanities Iowa and to Sustain for sponsoring this keynote session. Before we get started, let's turn to our community agreements. Please make sure to be respectful, curious, and patient. Speak from your own experience, taking care to avoid jargon. Be conscious of intent versus impact. Take space, make space, and of course, take care of yourself. We are here today with Rafael Meyer. Rafael is the founder and director of Fundacion Tortilla, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting corn and tortilla as fundamental elements of culture, nutrition, and Mexico's economic development. Amongst his most outstanding actions is his legal presentation and promotion of a bill initiative for the modification of the norm that regulates corn tortillas in Mexico, the country's most consumed product. Through Fundacion Tortilla's digital platforms, Rafael has developed information and communication strategies, creating over 500,000 followers, engaging with his specialized corn content, positively impacting over 20 million people each year. In 2022, Rafael was recognized as one of four social entrepreneurial leaders in Mexico by the Visionaris Awards granted by the UBS Bank. Rafael, thank you so much for being here. I am really looking forward to learning more about the work you are doing. Hello, Janine. Good afternoon. And good afternoon to all the people that are listening to us. I am very grateful to be here with the Seed Savers Exchange as a, as a guest. Thank you very much. So I will share my screen so we can start the presentation. You can see it now, Jenny? Here we go. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I will start with the presentation I prepared for today. I would like to talk about the importance of traditional food in terms of health, culture, and biodiversity. As Janine already told you, we are a non-for-profit organization which was founded in 2015, and we are devoted to promote the culture and consumption of corn and maize tortillas as fundamental elements of national well-being. In order to, to talk about corn, um, I think it's important to, to talk about its origin and the domestication of this very important crop, which originated in Mexico, Guatemala, and from there it's, it's spread down to the south and to the northern countries of the Americas. The origin of corn dates back 9,000 years ago. At that time, there were people living in the continent, especially here in this region of what we call Mesoamerica, and they were gatherers. They were collecting vegetables, fruits, different kinds of uh, fungus. They were also doing uh, some hunting, fishing, and other primal activities. And that's the way they used to, to gain their food. At that time, agriculture was just starting with the, with the cultivation of pumpkin, which was one of the eldest crops that has been cultivated in America. In Mexico, we have some wild grasses that are distributed from central Mexico south to Nicaragua. These grasses are the wild corn, corn relatives to which the corn is more closely related. These kind of grasses 
can be easily found even today. And at that time, 9,000 years ago, people, while they were traveling from one place and the other, at that time, the people doesn't have uh, houses as we know today, uh, as we have today. They, they were nomads and they were walking around. Uh, they could spend some time in one particular region, but they will move to other regions depending on the availability of food. The reason why people might be interested in this kind of grasses was because they could provide many different sources of food. One is its sugary stems. If you peel these kind of uh, grasses stems or stalks, you can obtain a fiber that is has a lot of sugar content and is an energetic food to it. You can also obtain some food from the fruits when they are fresh, when they are green, and they can be eaten raw. And also, if, if these fruits are uh, mature and they are completely dry, you can obtain some seeds or some grains that people grind them and eat them, probably toast them. And that was probably the way in which the ancient people of Mexico and Guatemala started consuming these wild grasses. At some stage, people started cultivating these grasses because they perceived them as an important source of food. And this special moment was the, 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 the start of agriculture in, in America. As I was mentioning before, the eldest crop that has been cultivated in America is pumpkin, but also corn is one of the eldest species to be cultivated in, in this region. The cultivation of corn started in what we call the Balsas River Basin. This is a very big river that is located in the state of Guerrero in central Mexico. Here is where the eldest evidence of the presence of maize was found. Especially these archaeologists, Anthony Renner and Dolores Piperno, they conducted a research in which they found these grinding stones in which corn starches were found that are the evidence that corn was actually being harvested and cultivated in this region around 8,700 years ago. From this uh, research, we can, we can know, or we, we now know, that the origin of corn was probably located in Mexico and from Mexico, the corn moved to other regions. The difference between the, the Mexican eldest evidences of corn is that we also have these relatives, wild relatives, all these teosintles that are still located in this region of Guerrero. Meanwhile, in South America, there's no presence of the wild relatives, nor there are two theories about the, the origin of corn. One is a unicentric theory in which it states that from Guerrero, the corn spread to both South and North America. And there's another theory that probably is more, more true, that we have like five different areas in which this agriculture could have started and this is located in central Mexico and Guatemala. So nowadays, Mexico and Guatemala are considered the center of origin of corn. From here, corn spread quickly to South America. So we found evidence of corn presence in Central America around 7,700 years ago. In South America, we have mazes that have more than 6,000 years. 
And in the North America, United States, and later on Canada, we could trace uh, the origin of corn around 4,000 years ago. After that, the corn was uh, conducted to, to Europe, to Africa, and to Asia, but that, that period is much more recent. No? As you can see, corn traveled to Europe around 500 years ago, to Africa around the same 500 years. Nowadays, corn be became one of the most important crops in the world, especially because it is used for many industrial processes. But corn is an excellent food source and, and an excellent energy, protein, fiber source of nutrients. And it has been adapted in many different cultures and regions in the world. So now we can have corn planted in almost every country in the world. The process of cultivation of corn took years, hundreds of years. And because of the selection of seeds and the interaction with many different people, women and men through history, they have been selecting their best seeds in order to improve their varieties, in order to develop new varieties. And that's how the, the corn started to spread all around. Also, Mexico and other countries of the Americas have a, a big range of diversity of climates and soil types. We have high elevations, we have coasts, we have deserts, we have forests, we have rainforests. And one of the special uh, characteristics of corn is that it can be adapted to multiple climates. And this adaptation start providing corns with different textures, different colors, different shapes. So both the interaction with people and the interaction with nature, with soil and climate was, was the, the origin of all these amazing diversity of corn that we have in America. Here you can see this picture is just a, a small sample of the Mexican diversity of maize. All of these ears of corn that you see in this picture are Mexican, but you can find diversity in many other countries of the whole continent, no? Just in Mexico, we have more than 59 land races of maces that are native to our land. And in the whole continent, you can find probably more than 220 different land races. What we call as a land race is a group of maces of maize diversity of varieties that could be uh, linked to one particular group but below these land races, you can find a big, big number of varieties. In Mexico, we could have probably thousands of varieties. And that's true because most of the farmers in Mexico, they are keeping and saving their seeds. They have their own reasons for keeping them. They have their own choices for selecting their seeds. And so, each of these families have their own variety by themselves. Here you can see some nice pictures of the land races of corn that we have in Mexico. All these pictures are, are part of the Conavios research that has been conducted in Mexico around 10 or 12 years ago. Conavio is the institution in Mexico which is in charge of promoting and uh, the biodiversity in our country. Here you can see that we have many different colors, we have many different shapes. We have corns present in all of our states, in all of our regions, and all of these different land races are still being planted in Mexico and used for different purposes. Of course, most of the uses that we 
have for these corns are for food. For food, Mexican people love to eat food made with corn. Here you can see some other land races. I invite you to visit this nice uh, website of the Conavio, where you can find all this information about these particular land races. All of these land races are what you call the heirloom corn, and we call them criollo, criollo corn or criollo seeds. All of them are old varieties. Most of them, they have been inherited from generation to generation. They have great local adaptability because they have been kept in, in particular regions. Usually, this kind of corn is produced by small scale farmers. And that's why they have limited production. Most of the people in Mexico are planting corn for self-sufficiency. They, they plant the corn they eat during the year, and probably they sell some surpluses if they have them. And one of the important thing is to mention is that these kind of corns are usually linked to traditional dishes and of course, to traditional cultures. Mexico have a lot of indigenous uh, groups, uh, ancient groups of cultural ethnic people that they still collect and they will still plant this corn as part of their main tradition. Corn is an excellent source of nutrients and that's why Mexico adapted as its most important food Corn is an excellent source of energy, proteins, a lot of minerals, and we also have a, a good range of fibers, lipids, and vitamins as well. In Mexico, a lot of techniques were developed in order to process and transform corn into dishes. And this knowledge was the created during centuries. We have been doing research, we have been developing different tools, different uh, equipment in order to produce and transform our corn into delicious and nutritious food. Here you can see some pictures about these processes. One of the most important processes that Mexico developed together with Guatemala was the nixtamalization. Nixtamalization is a process, a culinary process, in which dried maize kernels are cooked with food grade lime. This lime is what we call calcium hydroxide. Cooking corn with this calcium hydroxide provides very important nutritional and sensory benefits to the products made with this nixtamalized corn. This technique is so important because it releases the nutrients that the corn have and that if we don't cook it this way, we cannot really obtain all these benefits that the corn have for us. Especially, we have a, an increase in the bioavailability of niacin which is also called the vitamin B3. This vitamin B3 is related to the way in which we uh, absorb and how we uh, conduct our energy. The energy that the corn is providing us needs this vitamin B3 in order to be available. It also increases the iron and phosphorus availability. It improves digestion and it is also a very important source of calcium, especially in a continent where we don't have milk at that, at that time. The addition of calcium was very important in order to provide health to the Mexican and Guatemalan and other Central American countries. The most important food in Mexico nowadays is the tortilla, and it has been for a long, long time ago. This is our main staple food. We consume it a lot, more than 550 kgs per year. 
it's our average per capita consumption of tortillas. So we eat approximate one, around half a pound of tortillas daily. And the importance of tortilla is such that it is the main source of energy, protein, fiber, and calcium of the Mexican population. So you can imagine how important is this food for Mexico. But we also combine our food, our maize, with many other different fruits, grains, legumes, proteins that we also have. As you know, the whole continent is, is a land rich in different kind of uh, species that are now some of the most important crops in the world. We are the land of pumpkins and chilies and tomatoes, guavas, and so many other amazing and important crops. With all this, with maize and with all these other ingredients, Mexican cuisine became very rich and very diverse. We have many different dishes made out of corn, probably more than 700 dishes that can be prepared with corn. Combine it with other fruits, vegetables, and proteins. And this is our, our main source of nutrients for me in Mexico. One thing that is very important is that the, the Mexican culture has a permanence of its corn consumption and its techniques. Here I would like to, to talk about this famous painting of a uh, famous paint uh, artist called Diego Rivera, which is called the uh, Lady Making Tortillas. This is a picture that you can see probably 1800 years ago in rural areas in Mexico, and that it is still being common in the households of many rural areas in Mexico, using the same tools, the same comal, the same grinding stone, what we call the, the, the metate, and the tortillero, which is this basket in which we keep our tortillas warm. So one of the important things about the Mexican culture is that even though we have modern systems and we have machinery nowadays and we have a lot of uh, development in the process of our food, we still use and preserve many techniques and many processes and many tools that have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that makes the Mexican culture very important. Such, such important that Mexican, traditional Mexican cuisine was considered as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity by the UNESCO. And this was uh, a process in which Mexico participated and it was the first country in the world in which they gained this recognition. Here you can see a nice table of Mexican dishes made and prepared by a nice restaurant in the Yucatan Peninsula called Pancho Maiz. So we still have the old techniques, but we are also now serving them in the best restaurants in Mexico as well. The social importance of corn can be, can be explained with the multiple number of farmers that are still growing corn in Mexico. We have more than 2 million people, small scale farmers growing corn each year. And these 2 million small scale farmers are growing heirloom corns. So they are preserving their biodiversity. You can see here some pictures of some friends with whom we collaborate and we work, all of them Mexican farmers from all around uh, different states of Mexico and with different kinds of mazes, as you can see in the pictures. And all these mazes, as I was telling you, 
they have traditional dishes. And that's why I decided to talk about the importance of traditional food, because to preserve and to keep on planting our land races and our heirloom corns, we need to consume them. So in Mexico, we have special dishes in which we use special corns. And that kind of dishes are the ones that are sustaining the, the conservation of all this diversity. And I know that it is also true for, for other countries in the whole continent, also in the United States, in Canada, in Central and South America, we have our own traditional dishes in which all these old varieties of corn are used and are still consumed. So here you can see some, some pictures of some dishes, but I will talk about some of them. For example, this is a popcorn a land race that we produce in Mexico. It's called Tolonki in Otomi language and it is produced in the state of Mexico. This corn is still being uh, used for, for use for religious and special occasions for ceremonies. As you can see here, Masawa people and Otomi people, they still use popcorn in order to create different shapes of uh, to, 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 for their ceremonies, no? Different shapes for ceremonies. And also we eat the popkins, the popcorns, of course, no? Here you can see some colors of the state of Mexican popcorns. Here you can see another old variety of maize, probably one of the eldest varieties of corn in the world, which is called chapalote. And this chapalote is also a popcorn. I don't know if you know this, but most of the eldest varieties of corn are popcorns. So uh, land races like this tolonki and this chapalote are considered as one of the eldest varieties in the world. With this kind of corn, you can make popcorn and this popcorn is grinded and it is still consumed as a, as a powder what we call in Mexico pinole. And we also do popcorn balls, which is also a very ancient food in Mexico. We also have this other land race called the Reventador. It's also a popping corn. It is produced in the state of Jalisco. And it is also used for tortilla making and for tamales making. Another important dish that is preserving corn diversity is what we call pozole. Pozole is a soup that we consume a lot in Mexico. It is prepared with nixtamalized corn and it could have different kinds of proteins, pork, chicken, uh, shrimps or vegetables. And we have many different kinds and many different recipes all around Mexico in the different states in order to prepare this kind of food. But what is interesting about this is that the corns that are used for preparing this pozole are multiple land races. So each of the states and each of the regions have their own particular land race, which is preferred to prepare all these traditional soups. One of the most important ways of eating corn beside nixtamal and tortilla is fresh corn. And in Mexico, we eat a lot of boiled corn or also uh, grilled or roasted corn in the cup, no? And we have a, a big, big range of colors sizes, shapes, and of course, flavors of this fresh corn all around Mexico. The fresh corn season started between July and August and around these months until October. 
many places in Mexico are full of corn and you can you can try all these varieties in many places. And as you can see here, we have all the nutrients because I don't know if you have heard about this, but multicolored corns usually have more nutritional benefits than this, the white or the plain yellow corn. With all these red, purple, blue, you can have a lot of anti antioxidants. We have anthocyanins, we have flavonoids, and we have many other compounds that are very important for, for health. Here you can see one of the most amazing corns in Mexico. This is called the Jala corn. It is produced in a, in a town called Jala in the state of Nayarit, and it is considered as one of the biggest corns in the world. You in the, in the United States and Canada, you also have very big corns, uh, but this is one of the biggest of the ones we have in Mexico. For example, we have different Mayan corns that are still being used for the preparation of tamales called this mukbi pollo, or also steam tamales that are cooked underground in a process that can be traced probably 700, 7,000 years ago. We also use the sweet corn. The United States and Canada, you are the massive producers of sweet corn. And most of these sweet corns could probably be originated from these sweet corns that we have in Mexico. But the difference between us and, and, the, and the farmers in, in the United States and Canada is that this kind of sweet corn, what we do is that we toast them, we parch them and we cook them to, to make a, a food called Ponte Duro. In the central valleys of Oaxaca, we have a very important land race called bolita, bolita corn. Bolita means round or it means like a ball in Mexico because it has, their kernels have a, a rounded shape. And that's how, why we call it bolita corn. This bolita corn is the one we use for making tlayudas. Tlayudas is a big size tortilla that is toasted. So it is hard, it is crunchy, and we use it and we love it, especially in this state of Oaxaca. And here you can see the, the lovely colors this corn has. It, it could be found in white, purple, pink, even orange or yellow. Here you can see another land race called the Zapalote corn. This is still being used for making a particular kind of tostada or totopo. In fact, the name of this food is totopo. Totopo means toasted in, in Nahuatl. That was uh, our main languages. And as you can see, this kind of Totopos are baked in one very particular kind of oven called comiscal, which is similar to the kind of oven that the Indian people use for preparing their nans and their flatbreads and also Armenia and other countries in, in Asia. But we have them as well here in Mexico One of the most important foods is also what we call tlacoyos. Here you can see some blue corn tlacoyos and blue corn tortillas, which are prepared with a corn that is called conico or chalqueño. We have two land races that have been traditionally used for these kind of products. This food is usually uh, filled with beans, free fried beans, or you can also found them with fava, cheese, or some other fillings. Here you can see another land race called pop purple corn. It is uh, also a conico corn. The land race is conico, but it is a different color and a different variety than this one. And this has a lot, a lot of, of 
anthocyanins. And with this particular corn, there's a traditional dish called sour atole. This is a kind of porridge that in which the corn is soaked and fermented, providing a lot of a lot of uh, pro probiotics to the food. And we prepare this sour atole or sour porridge, which is consumed with ayocote beans, the kind of runner beans, what you call runner beans are these kind of beans that we use for this. And this is a food that is kept in Tlaxcala. Here you can see uh, also a, a very important land race called cacahuacintle. The cacahuacintle is this white corn. And this corn is special for making this kind of gorditas. It, it, these are some sweet gorditas that are, are still being sold in, in some plazas and in some uh, public spaces in Mexico City and Puebla. And also the cacahuacintle is a very important land race for making pozole, this soup that I uh, talked about uh, just a few minutes ago. So this is also a very important land race. For, and also it, it is also consumed a lot for fresh corn because it has big rounded uh, soft, milky kernels. So it is special for roasting and for boiling in their fresh stage. And probably the most important food which is preserving land races in Mexico is the tortilla itself. As I have mentioned, tortilla is the main food in Mexico and it, it is uh, we know that most of the land races in Mexico are still planted to produce tortillas. So as long as we Mexicans preserve our consumption of tortillas, we will keep on planting and promoting this culture and this uh, heritage of planting and eating maize in our countries. No? So the same as Mexico have, because we have such a big variety and such a big diversity, I think the whole continent, the whole countries of Central, South and North America have their own land races, their own varieties that needs to be preserved. So this uh, presentation is aimed to promote and to encourage you to learn about these antique ways of cooking, to keep on these traditions in order to keep our health, our culture, and also to preserve our diversity in our countries. So the Americas is the land of corn. So I want to invite you to embrace corn to do more research and to still promote the planting and consumption of corn as a as a food, no, not just as a industrial commodity, but also as a cultural food for our nations. So thank you very much. Here you can find some of our links to our websites. I apologize because most of the content is in, in Spanish. We are working to, to, to translate and to start doing a website that could be uh, read in English, but nowadays we have all our content in, in Spanish. But I know that many people in the United States and in other countries now speak Spanish, so I invite you to, to join to our website and our social media. So thank you very much, and I return to Janine. Rafael, thank you so much. Um, this presentation was beautiful, important, and very delicious looking. Um, we're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat and appreciation for what you've shared. 
Um, for those of you watching, if you have questions, we do have time for a Q&A. So please go ahead and add your questions to the chat and we will, um, I will read them to Raphael here. Um, while we give people a chance to do that, Raphael, how did you get started studying corn? Well, I started because I realized that Mexican people are losing their interest in corn. And I myself realized that, that I didn't knew that much about corn at that time. And one day I, that was like a kind of aha moment that I say, no, this is something bad. If Mexico is the center of origin of corn, why does we Mexicans are not learning about the importance of corn? And that's why I started doing research and to start to, to learn myself more about corn. And then I start sharing with other people what I knew, what I start uh, uh, learning. And that's how, how I started. Now I, I so this initial project converted into a non-for-profit organization in which you are, we are trying to, to spread the word of corn and the benefits of corn because we, we think that Mexico Mexico's future needs to be related to corn, no? And also the whole continent, no? Absolutely. Um, you talked about how corn is adaptable to so many different places and climates. Um, is there something specific like could you pick out what corn is mexican corn or do they adapt in ways that that um aren't as easy to pick out uh well all, all of the corns uh, have been adapted through centuries and years of of planting in different locations no so what, it, what is interesting about corn is that they can actually adapt to different conditions and different places. That will take some years. You know, at, the, at the early stages, when you move corn from one region to the other, you might probably have a very bad harvest and you can probably be disappointed. But what it is interesting about corn is it has such a, such a broad diversity in their genetics that it could eventually adapt to different conditions, no? And that's how we ended with corn all around and all spread in all the countries. One particularity of corn is that it can be planted in hot weathers, no warm weathers, and also in, corn, in cold weathers as well, no? It cannot uh, tolerate frost and, and freezing, but in most of the countries, you can plant them in spring you know, and summer. Right. I have a question here from Susanna Abbey. Um, do you know if there are community trade, seed trade systems in northern Mexico similar to what we have here um, with the exchange? Well, what Mexico has been working now is uh, with seed first. And there are many states in which seed first have been promoted. Uh, for example, in northern Mexico, there the Sinaloa has been organizing some seed first, also Chihuahua. So in these first, people could go and trade and 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 can have access to some to some seeds. No. Normally, there is we don't have such an, a strong association or like like uh, seed savers that's something that we would like to learn and we would like to promote in mexico uh, but but we are willing to to do that no we think that it's great to share and to have exchanges of, of seeds you no know, and to spread the word of these crops yeah. no yeah um Priya is asking, what is being done to protect these corns from genetically modified corn contamination? Well, uh, Mexico has a ban for planting GMO corn. So we have a legal uh, prohibition of, of GMO planting here in Mexico. And with this new government, it has been promoted and uh, there's a decree, a presidential decree, 
in which this uh, ban of the GMO corn was uh, stated. So this is very important. And we are also in a process to avoid the use of, gly of glyphosate. This herbicide that, you, as you probably know, is closely related to the production of GMO corn. And we also have a, a decree, this same decree, the, the government is, uh, is proposing and is promoting that no GMO corn could be used for tortilla processing uh, in, the, in the next years, no? From 2025, and we will not have any glyphosate, and we're also working towards the ban of GMO corn using our tortillas. And this is this is something that is in the middle of the of the of the negotiations because the the United States government and the Canada government are pushing the Mexican government to not implement these uh, these uh, policies. No. Mm -hmm. So, but but there are many people that we are among those people and or those associations that we are helping. And we are promoting that this prohibition of GMO corn is, is, is uh, complied. Great. I have a question here from, oops, I just lost it. Okay, we'll get back to that one. I have one here from Sean. Does Teosinte cross with domesticated corn? If so, does Teosinte represent a useful ag additional genetic diversity resource for future breeding efforts? Yes, Sean, uh, that's a good question. And yes, the teosintle can actually be uh, combined with, with corn. They could reproduce, not all of the teosintles, there are some particularities about these uh, reproduction systems between teosintles and maize, but yes, for sure. And they are considered as, as, as very important genetic resources. Mexico has been conducted a lot of research and, and, and also a lot of efforts in order to preserve their wild relatives. No, we have these Teosintle populations, and we also have also a species called uh, Tripsacum that has, is also considered as uh, important genetics uh, materials and, and, and crops, of course, for, for, the, for the future of, of uh, of the humanity, no? So yes, there's a lot of, of research. If you're interested, I would invite you to go to the Conavio website. They have a particular section uh, which uh, explain all the efforts that have been conducted for Teosintle conservation. Okay. Um, a related question here uh, about uh, genetic diversity. Do local farmers do deliberate cross-pollinations constantly with neighbor corn varieties to improve genetic diversity? Yes, Gabriel. Many people, they, they uh, save their seeds and they exchange uh, uh, corns with other farmers, with other neighbors, because they know, they, most of the people, they know that their maces could be enriched if they have, uh, if they bring some other lines or if they bring some other uh, special ears from other neighbors or from other uh, friends. So that's something that is commonly made in, in Mexico. No? And also we have a lot of cross-pollination between the, the fields no? because in many towns there's no, there's no way to, to isolate the fields. So yeah, cross-pollination do happen. No? And many times we have people that plant probably a blue corn together with a white corn, and then we have this pinto corn or multicolored corn. So that's something that is happening every year in Mexico, no? So the land races in Mexico are in constant, in constant evolution and in constant selection and improvement year by year by these two million people of farmers. I have a question here. Um, you've shared so many beautiful, delicious looking dishes. Do you have a favorite corn dish? Well, I like, I like many. I have been studying popcorns for, for a long time. So I really like uh, 
these uh, popcorns because especially and sadly in Mexico nowadays all the popcorn consumption is coming from the US Mexico has mm -hmm. lost most of their uh, varieties nowadays and now most of them are endangered so I have a, a special uh, attraction for popcorns and I have been working a lot with them but I love tortillas I love pozole and tamales, many, many dishes that are delicious and are important, no? Yeah. Speaking of popcorn, on the uh, Tolonki popcorn image, it looked like it was popped on the cob. Ah, uh, yes. I've never seen that. How is that done? Yeah, you can pop, you can pop these, uh, these corns either in a microwave or if you can have like a special uh, oven in which you have like air, circulating you can pop no this uh, this uh, popcorns in the in the cup in the united states many many companies and many farmers sell their uh, old varieties there there are companies that there are farmers that they that they grow ancient popcorns like for example these uh, where well, there are there are many there are many old varieties of cup popcorn in the united states and canada as well no yeah. And many of them, they are commercialized uh, as popcorn in the cup. If you do some research, you will find some some people selling those in the United States. Yeah. Um, if anyone has any more questions, we have just an, enough time for one or two more questions. Um, I think one of my questions, Rafael, is what do you see as the future or what do you hope to see as the future for corn? Um, not only in Mexico, but worldwide? Well, I think in Mexico, this, uh, this step of banning completely the GMO corn is very important, no? because uh, the main difference between Mexico and the United States is that Mexico is actually consuming corn as a food. And in the United States, uh, unfortunately, you are not eating that much corn as we are. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's a big big difference between the the consumption and uh, of corn in both countries. And also in Mexico, there's a there's a recovery, and people are really appreciating this culture nowadays. 10, 20 years ago, people were uh, not really interested in tortillas and tamales. Mm -hmm. They were looking that as as not not the uh, not the best foods. And nowadays we are realizing that this tradition and these techniques are so important and that they have been feeding us with nutrition and healthy food for so many centuries. And now people are realizing that this is very important. So things are changing a lot in Mexico. We are also working in many different uh, areas, in many different strategies in order to, to increase the the interest and increase the importance of corn so what i see is to to still consume corn i am i am looking forward to increase the amount of land races corn that are uh, consumed in mexico i will also like to preserve many different uh, land races especially with these dishes no and, and, and some others, because also we can be innovative and there's a whole range of products and uh, dishes that can be developed with corn. And that's what I would like to see, no? Of course, uh, opportunities for the people in the, in the, in the fields, in the farms, uh, cultural conservation, uh, the people that are benefiting from this, no? And of course, health. We want to recover our health. Mexico is facing a lot of problems uh, regarding its, its uh, food, uh, especially uh, we are facing health problems. We have a lot of uh, diabetes and chronic diseases that are related with, with, a, bad, uh, with a bad food no? habits. So that's something. And also one thing that I would like to see is to, to see, cons to increase the consumption of corn as a food, and that's especially in other countries. No, uh, I think that the United States and Canada could, could benefit a lot if they start switching the way they are viewing corn 
and start looking at it as a source of food as it is it's meant to be, uh, no? So, and also many other areas in the world. As you know, a scarcity of food can be a problem in many places. Uh, the, the increase in population and all these uh, uh, a risk and risk and that we have in the in the future, the corn could be a, a great solution for for providing good energy and good food for many countries and many people. Yeah. Thank you. We have a few people asking about this um, information. Um, the Tiosente information website. I don't think I have that. Where is okay. that? Okay. Let me see if I can find it or I can show you, Jan. Yeah. While you're looking that up, I just want to echo. Um, so many people here just saying thank you. Keep up your amazing work. You're inspiring all of us here with this presentation. So thank you so much for all of that. Thank you. Thank you very much to all you. And of course, thank you to Seed Savers, to you, Janine, and for to Michael, which was the one who started this idea for yeah. into this uh, important uh, event. Here, here I just shared the the website of the Teosintles, no? Um, I'm not seeing that. I think you're... you're. It's because I I don't know if... I only have this one shot. I don't know if I read chat, no, here. Oh, yes, we've no. got it. All right. Cindy, do you have that? Okay, we will put that... There are many there. articles. There are many articles that have been published about the Teosintles. If you are interested, you can probably send me an email. I think Janine will share my email. If someone yes. has any additional questions or want to talk to, to me or, or to know more about our efforts, we can you can contact me and I will help you and I will assist you to get some information about this to Great. Rafael, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, thanks everyone for being here. This has been a real treat. Thank you very much, Janine. And, and let's keep on uh, listening to all these interesting conferences and program you have prepared for us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.